Okay, well, welcome everybody to, this is our fourth Physician in the Community Showcase. It's hard to believe, um, but thank you for coming. Um, this is, this is, you know, a big day for all of us in terms of all of the work that's been put in um, over the course of two years um, for the students that are presenting their projects today. So, you know, our goal here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, Central Wisconsin, um, is that all students that train here will become community engaged physicians. And so um, the physician in the community course and the projects that you do um, are one of the main ways that we try to help accomplish that vision um, of Dr. Dodson's. So I guess I'm just gonna say this for anybody that's watching on, on YouTube. My name is Dr. Corey Norbaum. I'm a family physician and I'm one of the co-directors of the Physician in the Community course here at Medical College of Wisconsin, Central Wisconsin. And you'll meet the other co-director um, at the end of the program. So. So just to reiterate again, um, this two-year community-engaged scholarly project um, is really uh, a way for students to um, develop relationships in the community and to develop a better understanding about some of the issues um, that are facing communities um, and to think about how um, the health priorities and the social determinants of health that impact those priorities can affect the health of their patients and the communities that um, they live and work in. So today, or today, um, you've been able to see the posters um, and you know, like talk with students about their projects. But we're going to have five presentations, um, and each of the students will come up and uh, give a presentation. And after the presentation, there'll be a chance to ask some questions. So um, before we get started uh, with the presentations, I just wanted to give a shout out to Terry Walkush and um, everybody on the staff here at MCW that helped make this possible um, for Peter for getting the live streaming going. Um, and also to Dr. Dodson for her vision and inspiration for this course and um, the community engaged uh, mission. So without further ado, I'm going to have Colton Brown come up so that he can give his presentation. We good to go? Yeah? Okay. All right. It's kind of intense with the camera. I feel like I'm <laughs> addressing the nation. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, all right. So thanks to everyone for watching today and for letting me kick off this part of the showcase. Um, the title of my project is Lena's Little Learners Using Validated Screening Tools to Detect Developmental Delays During a Pandemic. So we'll start with a little background. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, LENA is a program that's tasked with supporting language development in kids by educating parents on the importance of talking to their children while they are still young. Um, one of the tools that LENA has in their repertoire to help accomplish that goal are word counting devices that fit in the clothes of their child and help parents to keep track of how often their kid is being spoken to. So, if you look up and you see this little fella I have on the screen here, he's wearing the Lena vest and in the front there's a pouch and inside that pouch the word counting device goes and again that just helps to um, uh, parents to keep track of how many words are spoken to him and uh, how many conversation turns he's taking with the adults in his life. Uh, so that's Lena. Um, but I got the idea for my project while working with a, a graduate of our campus who was also working with the Lena cohort. And as part of his project, we determined that the kids enrolled in the LENA program at that time exhibited higher rates of developmental delay 
than we would have expected relative to uh, the general population. So we thought this was a bit of a concerning trend and I decided to uh, do a pilot project to kind of chase down this lead and see how prevalent this issue of speech and language delays might be uh, in, our, in our local community here. Uh, so you might wonder uh, why this is such a big deal. After all, most of the, these kids are really little. Um, none of them are in school yet, so you might wonder why we care so much how their language uh, development is coming along when they're so little. Um, but if you dig into the neuroscience behind this a little bit, it's actually pretty clear that this is important stuff. Uh, so up on the screen, I've got a few different images. Uh, let's see if this works, yeah. I can use the mouse. Um, anyway, up on the screen I've got some different images, um, some MRI images here at the top, and it just shows uh, a developing brain. So if we focus in on the images, especially the ones from earlier on in life, you can see that a lot is happening from one point in time to the next. So from one week to three months to one year to two years, etc. cetera. Um, you can see that the brain is getting bigger, it's getting more complex, that the skull is growing to accommodate all that's happening on the inside with the brain. Uh, but behind the scenes, what's happening is that the child's brain is growing billions of neurons. So when I was doing my literature review, the estimates that I was seeing was as high as 700 new neural connections are being formed every second uh, in a little kid's brain. So uh, that's actually reflected down there in that little, in that smaller picture down there in the corner. You can see all those connections that are being made as time progresses. And that's really uh, the essence of why early childhood development is so important. Um, early language really serves as the scaffolding for uh, more advanced skills to be built on. And if this critical window where brain plasticity is at its highest gets missed, it's really, really difficult to go back in time and try to help these kids close achievement gaps after the fact. So, and, and that happens early by the age of five. Uh, just to further highlight the point of the importance of early intervention, this slide shows a graph that summarizes the work of a uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics named James Heckman. So this is the Heckman curve. And uh, his work demonstrated that investing funding into programs that target kids when they're younger provides a much, much, much higher return on investment than investing in programs at later ages. So um, his work is actually really fascinating. And there's a lot of other economists that have looked at the same issue and have found that, uh, have found similar findings. And a lot of the estimates you'll see are as high as four to nine dollars for every one dollar invested in early childhood programs um, is kind of the return on investment. And that, uh, that return on investment comes in many different forms. Higher, uh, higher achieving kids tend to have lower disease burden later in life as one example. So with all that in mind, um, here were the objectives that we hope to tackle with my project. So I was interested in executing a pilot project for efficiently and accurately screening local kids for possible language delays. I wanted to assess the development of kids that were participating in the Lena Start program specifically. We wanted to compare the results of our interactive virtual screening tool that we did to the Lena developmental snapshot, which is a a uh, tool that is part of the, the LENA curriculum, part of the LENA program that they use weekly to kind of trend um, how kids are per, uh, uh, progressing through the program. And then we wanted to discuss appropriate additional resources with families. So screeners are really only worth anything if you do something based on the results that you see. So this last point is probably the most important. When we saw kids that we were worried about for potentially having some delays, we uh, did something about it. We tried to connect them to resources, uh, be it at the Chief Center locally or um, elsewhere. Um, to accomplish this, we recruited LENA families at their weekly LENA meetings. Um, we needed to select a screening tool to be used, and after an extensive search and a long list of potential tools, we ended up deciding on the Ages and Stages Questionnaire, or the ASQ. And we picked that one based on criteria such as the developmental domains that it covered, uh, the ages that it covered, and the opportunity for parent participation, which research shows uh, that uh, sort of parents' account of how their kids are doing is just about as good as um, 
observing it yourself. It's very accurate. We opted to do things through Zoom, and this was both because of the limitations that the pandemic placed on us, obviously, um, but like I alluded to earlier, this was a pilot project, and we were looking for a way to do this sort of thing efficiently that could easily be scaled up to reach more kids in the future if needed. Um, and then at the end of each, uh, uh, each Zoom appointment, free response questions were asked of parents and this covered topics like whether or not parents, um, especially first time parents, felt that they had the resources that they needed to foster speech and language development and the struggles that they were facing regarding um, trying to work on these things at home in isolation during a pandemic. Um, it's, it's hard to work on speech and language when you're isolated or when you're out in public and a kid can't uh, watch your mouth move, watch how you're forming your words, things like that. So a lot of uh, concerns and, and things like that come up. So here's a couple pictures of how that worked. So this is just a snapshot that I took, a screenshot of one of our Lena appointments. So I'm up there kind of giving the screener and then down below we've got some of our participants, uh, uh, mom with her little ones and then we've got Carol Wesley from the Achieve Center who was my mentor, uh, my community mentor for this project and was really uh, key and, and helped me quite a bit. But she was there to kind of collect observational data and um, help advise parents during the sessions as needed, uh, answer questions that they had just because she's got a lot of experience. This is just kind of an example of, of how those go. So you can see um, in real time, we're able to bring up a question that we find on the screener. So can your child, um, this one's looking at fine motor, for example, can your child string items such as beads, macaroni, pasta, things like that onto a string? And we're able to watch that in real time in the kid's home environment, which is important. It's important to observe what their, what their home environment looks like and, and work on some of these things in real time. Um, up top here, that's an example of how the ASQ is scored. So for each child, a numerical score is calculated for each of the areas of development. Individual scores are then compared to the thresholds that are set by the ASQ. So um, if they're in the black zone, then that's probably a concern. Gray zone, we're not so sure. And if they make it into the white zone, then they're probably where they need to be for their age. Um, and then there's some breakdowns of how the kids scored, but it's probably better if we just advance one. This is probably a little clear. So here you can see uh, we're comparing what we're seeing on the snapshot to what we're seeing in the ASQ. So a red X indicates we are worried about a potential delay. Green check mark tells us that we're above the cutoff and then a blue square means we're close to cutoff. So you can see in some instances, so subject A for example, um, we are, snapshot says everything's good but ASQ says that maybe there's concern for delay and it picks up uh, for that particular person that maybe they were delayed in their personal social skills which is something that is incorporated into this comprehensive screener that we don't use on the snapshot. So it's a little more comprehensive and, and can capture some more. Um, so for the big takeaways, we found that 50% of the participants fell below the ASQ cutoff in at least one category. So a significant amount of these kids had concern for delays. Um, this Lena snapshot tool performance was comparable to the ASQ, it was actually very comparable in terms of detecting language delays only. So it's not as comprehensive and it didn't pick up a lot of the other things. Um, the language related areas is, is sort of the verbiage that I used in my project, but um, I'll talk about that in just a second here, but nothing happened sort of in isolation. We found that the virtual format was a viable tool in assessing child development, so this could uh, be scaled up if needed. And then the last one I don't think was a surprise to anybody, but the pandemic does place significant burden on families that are raising kids going through these key stages. Um, if they can't be around grandma, grandpa, can't be in daycare around other kids, can't be um, watching how people are forming their words, seeing people's mouths because they're high, behind masks when they're out in public, um, all of those things kind of play into it. And I've got a little bit of a word cloud that I just pulled um, based on responses that, that the parents gave me on some of those free response. So you could see they're worried about daycare, they're worried about networking, education, social interaction, um, all, all sorts of things. Um, as far as future directions, we hope to continue to provide screening to the community at a larger scale. I think that the, the need exists. I think we pretty clearly showed that and um, it, it would be great to be able to do that. Um, Lena Start Marathon County is going to consider broadening the scope of their developmental screener to encompass some more of these domains. Uh, the reason why it's important 
to look at some of those things um, that the ASQ checks for that the Lena Snapshot tool doesn't pick up is because we know that um, kids don't develop individual skills in isolation. Things are kind of co-developing and interconnected in a way that a deficit in one area can lead to a deficit in another area, so it's really important to kind of look at the full picture. And I just snapped a couple cutouts of some research articles that kind of spoke to that effect. So yeah, that was my project. Thanks so much to Dr. Norbaum, who was there from the beginning on this one. Uh, Carol at the Chief Center, who was uh, just awesome to work with and shared a lot of her time and her resources, and I am really happy to have worked for her, or worked with her. And then, of course, the Community Engagement Fund for funding the project. Thanks. We have time for one question. Anybody have any questions? We've all heard a lot about Lena, so. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. All right. And our next presenter is Amanda Wright. Hi, everybody. I'm Amanda Wright. And the project that I worked on um, is entitled The Impacts of Teen Mentoring Program on Medical Student Mentors. So with my program, I worked with our local um, EEA, the Enrich Achieve Excel Learning Academy in town here. I'll give you a little bit more about that with the clicker. Does it click this way? Okay, there. So to give a bit of a background on this. So in, or as we learned from Colton's project, children are exposed to adverse life um, experiences. And those that are, um, ones that experience more of this, tend to have higher risk of complications later in life. This is a Ben well researched and established throughout many years of literature. Um, some examples of adverse childhood experiences include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, neglect, um, household dysfunction, even divorce, or a parent who's incarcerated, just to name a few of these 10. Complications of these adverse effects long term can include obesity, diabetes, depression, and even early death. ACEs also predispose people to very risky behaviors in life such as alcohol misuse, drug use, and intimate partner violence. Gaining skills in resiliency, though, can help mitigate these effects if they're earned later in life and help them in the long term. So EEA, as I brought up before, is a charter school, and that was founded in 2005 in order to provide an alternative learning structure for students who've struggled in a traditional academic learning environment. So many of these um, children may come from a wide variety of backgrounds. They are middle and high schoolers who may be teen parents. They may have medical conditions. They may lack a stable or supportive home life or may have issues with truancy. But there's really any number of factors that a student could be one of these particular students at EEA. So um, there's, um, they also have a core computer curriculum in which they allow to have a flexible schedule, um, but yet a standardized teaching, and then there's teachers on site that can help them and social workers that help them succeed. So each, um, about every week about, or every month, um, students from our school, the Medical College of Wisconsin, partner with EEA in order to tutor or mentor the students one-on-one. -on -one. In addition to helping with schoolwork, the medical students provide a stable adult interaction for kids who may not have such a reliable adult in their lives. Okay, so the methods of this project. There were 15 medical student mentors this past year and tutors that met regularly via a virtual platform with the teenagers. And they either tutored, mentored, or both. And 
with their assigned EEA student. So in the past, we've you know, I've had about like one to two mentors. So there was a need this year to have a more robust mentorship and tutoring program, a better idea of how to communicate with these students, both um, on the medical student side and on the teenagers. So the medical students this year, we looked at the data for them um, and they completed online surveys before and after the second semester of the academic year to assess their comfort levels with interacting with teenagers and those with high ACEs scores. So the survey also assessed just how comfortable these mentors and tutors were with interacting with teenagers and just if they could, um, felt like they had the tools in order to talk about very difficult conversations that may occur with their one-on-one -on -one interactions. Additionally, we asked the students what improvements could be implemented and we compared the pre and post surveys. Okay, so for results, um, for the, um, we surveyed every student who attempted to be a mentor or a tutor. Um, some of them did not regularly meet with a teen partner because if you've ever been around kids, they're not always reliable to getting on the computer at their assigned meeting time. But um, what we found in our pre and post assessments is that all the surveyed medical students knew what ACEs were and they could identify their own that they had accumulated as their, um, in their personal life. And in the beginning, many were anxious um, about interacting with a teenager via a virtual platform instead of the traditional in-person interactions that we had had in years past and creating a trusting relationship via an internet call. But we found that in these results that after working with the teens and over the course of the semester that the mo many more med students said that they were far more comfortable interacting with teenagers. They were more comfortable interacting with those who had a background that was maybe different than their own upbringing. They were far more uh, comfortable in developing those interpersonal relationships and having those difficult conversations with these teenagers that they may not have been able to do before the program. So here are some key thoughts, just a little bit of um, data you can read some of these that, but basically overall what those that interacted with the teenagers from the medical student side, they loved that they were um, just an ear for that student that may not have had a person that they could reach out to. They watched confidence grow in the students and they just watched a little bit of creativity sometimes, which I thought was really, really interesting and cool. And they loved that the kids could express their true feelings to them. So conclusions of this project um, this year was that the mentorship experience was a valuable experience for the medical students and that they learned quite a bit about those that they were interacting and could develop a trusting relationship and that it was that, you know, it's not just that when you're a mentor that you're trying to help out somebody else but you have to think about its impact on yourself as well because it's going to change you as well. So they experienced this hands-on learning experience that assisted in the education of a young person, which is all very important in the practice of being a physician someday. So after participating in this volunteer program, the medical students were very comfortable and um, in some of the surveys as well, they just said that even if it's not a teenager, I feel like I can talk to anybody with a little bit more of a trust. I know how to build these communication skills a little bit better. And it also helped give some of our students a, um, a consistency um, in the uncertainty of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it gave them something to look forward to every week. In the future, we um, have two wonderful students working on the project as well right now. So um, we're thinking that we would like to obtain more data on how the impact is on the EEA students themselves. Um, we um, would like to look at potentially with the students graduation rates, tardiness and behavior in school as well as long term stress levels to see how the program is affecting the students that are at the EEA Academy. And additionally we'd like to survey the medical students that participated in this program later in their careers as full fledged physicians to see if what they learned in the mentorship program really could be helpful for their patient care in the future. Time for any questions. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Thank you.
Our next presenter is Sierra Dannon. Hello, my name's Sierra, and I'm going to present on my Pathways project on path, pap smear protocols in high-risk populations. So for this project, I worked with Health First, which is a community clinic that focuses on women's health. Um, not that one. There we go. So nothing to disclose today. We're going to kind of do some background, look at our objectives, how we conducted it, and then our results and where we're hoping to go next. So just a little background on pap smear guidelines. So the pap smear guideline that came out in 2012 recommended starting screening at age 21 and then screening every three years until the age of 30. At the age of 30, they recommend changing to co-testing or screening with cytology and HPV testing every five years or continuing with the three-year cytology testing alone. In 2020, so about a year ago, new guidelines came out from the American Cancer Society recommending screening at the age of 25, so pushing it back a little bit. And then they recommend starting screening right away with the every five years co-testing with cytology and HPV or doing just the three years with cytology alone. Um, because this did come out in 2020, there's not a lot of clinics using this guideline yet just because it is more recent, um, but it's the newest one that's came out. So we dug a little bit into the patient population that these guidelines were looking at and noticed a couple things before we even looked at our data. So the first thing is with patients with non-private insurance, so those individuals on government insurance like Medicaid or Bagicare, had higher rates of cervical cancer. This was really important at Health First since when we look at our patient population, 95% of our patients are on Medicaid. So they are not having this private insurance that these patients within the American Cancer Society patient population had. Additionally, just our location in a rural community increases the cervical cancer rates. So because of this, we kind of decided our objectives. So we wanted to evaluate all patients who underwent colposcopies at Health First to determine if there were any risk factors that would indicate that maybe we should deviate from these, er, from these guidelines and screen our patients more often. Um, it's important to note while these guidelines are really important, our patient populations are very different, which we kind of highlighted in our data that I'll talk about in a little bit. So how do we conduct this? We did a retrospective study. We pulled all colposcopies that were done between April 2012 and October 2019. From this, unfortunately, we did have to exclude 12 just due to unable to find the paper charts, having duplicate numbers, um, wrong client IDs or undergoing the procedure and not taking an actual sample. In the end, we ended up analyzing 377 patients. From this, we looked at basic demographic data, sexual practices, condom use, um, contraceptive use, and how many partners they've had. So from this, we have our results. Um, so starting with just some demographic data is when we saw the discrepancies between the American Cancer Society's patient population and ours. So first we noticed the number of colposcopies seems to be increasing each year. It's important to note that 2019 was the highest year yet and that data only went through October. So this total data was less likely higher than this at the end of the year. Additionally, when you look at age of colposcopy, we have 75 patients under the age of 25 that had abnormal pap smears that led to colposcopies. With the new guidelines, with the 2020, these patients wouldn't even be screened yet with pap smears and therefore wouldn't be recognized at this young age. Additionally, our mean age was 30.5. Compared to the American Cancer Society patient population, this is 18 years younger. So we saw that we had a much younger patient population. Next, we looked at the number of sexual partners. Our mean was almost 11, which was much higher than their patient population, which was around one to two. Additionally, you can see we have a wide use of contraceptives. Most likely, most common is oral contraceptives. This is where it gets a little concerning. So SDI history, lots of SDIs within our patients. Most importantly, we have 122 patients who had a history of HPV. With HPV being the number one cause of cervical cancer, this was a really big concern for us. Additionally, you can see with condom use that a majority of our patients do not use condoms, and a small numbers still sometimes use condoms. 
So this is a big concern because without regular condom use, the spread of STIs will continue to go through our communities. So these are the colposcopy results of the patients. Um, figure seven shows all the results, and then figure eight shows the individuals who said they sometimes use condoms or don't use condoms at all. You can see the charts are very similar in shape, so we know that condom use is a big concern with our patients. It's important to note too, as we move from the left to the right on the bottom, the results are worse. So benign being the best, and then AIS is cancer. This then is 74 patients who underwent a pap smear within four years of having a negative pap smear. So if we would switch the 2020 guidelines screening every five years, these patients would not be identified until five years later and therefore would be missed, further suggesting earlier screening in high-risk patients. So from this, we have a couple recommendations within Health First that we're looking to continue. So earlier pap smears than the recommended three to five years um, based on patients' sexual behaviors and STI history. Additionally, we are encouraging condom use since we did have such high STI rates within our patient population. So our future goals, unfortunately, when we started the project, we didn't look at Gardasil vaccination rates or smoking rates. With the new 2020 guidelines, one of the key factors for pushing the age back to 25 from 21 is the increased Gardasil vaccination rates and therefore decreased HPV rates in the patient population the study looked at. So this will be something really important for our patient population to determine if our Gardasil vaccination rates are up or down. And if they are down, really encouraging, of course, getting vaccinated. And then also we're hoping to expand our data set into 2021. And great news, we've already got some interest, so the project will be continuing. And then really big thank you to Jessica and April at Health First. Um, they really wanted to do this project and were motivated and were fantastic helping me through it. So thank you to them. And then any questions? Okay, so the question is, with more frequent pap smear testing, is with the government insurance, would that cover that? So they're thinking it would be, it would just have to be coded different. So it wouldn't be able to be coded as a preventative screen, it would be covered as more of like a problem screen or something along those lines to get it covered. The question is how COVID affected colposcopy rates and screening. And for that, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I know they did have kind of a decrease in patients coming in for a while, but I'm not sure how that affected their overall numbers. Not that we saw, because it was such a small sample size. Um, definitely something we're looking into more as we continue the data set out. Oh, sorry, whether there was clinical significance in the younger patient populations. I forgot I had to repeat the question. <laughs> And our next presenter is Meg Lieb. Should we go ahead and get started? Can you guys hear me okay? Holy cow, talking in front of people again, this is new. Okay, so my project is um, 
this program we created called SPO, or Seeking Peer Outreach. It's an integrated tiered approach to addressing stigma and isolation uh, in the medical community. So why do we care? Uh, the AMC, AAMC reports that medical students are three times more likely to die by suicide than their same age peers. This isn't something that's new to our institution. Um, as for last fall, this was the email that went out to students as we mourned and moved on from the suicide of MCW student Armand Halim. Um, this was the third student or resident suicided in the past four years. Suicide in medicine is not a new phenomenon. Um, this book here uh, called What I Learned in Medical School I think really embodies the culture that contributes to this epidemic in a sense. Um, it says medical school in many ways is like a boot camp patriarchal, militaristic, and designed to strip you of your individuality and turn you into a physician clone devoid of personality, emotion, or creativity. Your life is hijacked, you're told what to do every minute of the day, and overloaded with homework at night. Always trying to catch up, you devise ways to try to make up for lost time, you shorten your conversations with friends and family until you virtually no longer talk with them, you limit your daily routines until they're unfamiliar. Before you know it, Little of your previous life remains. This culture has created a propensity to last our lifetime. So this data here shows in red is the general public uh, per number of completed si suicides per 100,000 pers persons per year. Um, and blue is physicians. Um, so you can see that throughout our lifetime, a majority of it includes our increased suicide risk compared to the general population. So the object objectives of my program were, or my Pathways Project, I guess, were to address the alarming statistics, healthcare and educational related suicide, and respond to the institutional suicide rates. We wanted to research existing methods for aligning suicide, or aligning the Suicide Prevention Council um, with MCW specific risk factors, which through a mental health climate survey of the MCW community, uh, we identified as being stigma and isolation. And then we also wanted to identify best practices um, for making this program accessible to everyone. This was especially important in the time of COVID, um, but it also is really prevalent in our other campuses with uh, racial, and um, LGBTQIA plus communities. Sorry, I'm not good at acronyms. So this is the MCW's first official suicide prevention program. And going forward, the goal is gonna be to evaluate the efficacy of the program. So as for methods, um, the Suicide Prevention Council was actually created in response to the previous suicides. Um, it was started or initiated by Dean Kirshner. Um, and so the SPC, the Council Suicide Prevention Council, oversees everything that has grown into the SPO, Su Seeking Peer out Outreach Program. Um, they oversee the inclusion function obstacles and they also were a big part in identifying the stigma and isolation risks. So over the year or so that I was doing working on this project, um, we searched across the nation for different programs that exist that we could use and eventually kind of realized that there was nothing that really met the caliber, caliber of our uh, unique population. Um, we really wanted to make sure we were finding something that had both peer support and training education resources. Oh, sorry, I'm working two different things here. <laughs> so with best practices, um, that's something I'm gonna get to kind of with the rest of the talk. So ultimately though, peer support um, comes from a program at Freighter called SOS. Um, the Guardian is kind of a mixed thing that we pulled from various trainings across the country. And then we also created a few things on our own to really enhance the accessibility of the program. 
So our first step here is we've reached or we've gotten internal funding from Dean Dodson to implement a pilot program here at Central Wisconsin. So you guys will be the first population who get to experience the benefits of this program. Um, and we're working it in through the 4C navigation team. So making it more catered to a learning communities. I'll get into the different ways that we're getting data collection on it. And then we're hoping to just analyze ways that it's causing a culture change and an impact in our community. So to go in more to this, I already explained it a little bit, um, but let's dissect that out a little bit. So the SOS program is from Freighter. And so here's the, this pyramid here kind of provides the foundation we built the SPO off of. Tier one really includes everyone in the, SP, in the MCW community. It represents colleague support. Um, tier two is kind of an additional level of trained supporters. The attention between tier one and tier two is for members of the community to support each other, erode unnecessary or barriers between students and faculty and staff and the various campuses, uh, promote recovery after crises, and promote future functioning and culture of safety. So why we, one of the reasons we went with this model is just because of how much success they've had. This data is over their first year of using this um, at Freighter. That was more, they made it as a secondary victim syndrome, syndrome program. So after things go south um, in the hospital, <laughs> then uh, providers or whoever may have been involved have support from it. Um, so as you can see, those numbers are pretty high with how many, just sheer number of interventions that were done through tier two. And then tier three is kind of a third tier support um, referral for professionals um, in case it goes beyond those of just being the skills of peer support. So from that, this looks very similar. This is the SPO model. And so tier one again, um, is created for that cultural change. Um, that's what you guys are gonna be experiencing in your learning communities with basic um, skills of understanding yourself, understanding your peers, learning more about mental health, and helping develop a transparent, vulnerable type of culture. The tier two is the selected individuals. Um, it's kind of in the public health model represents secondary prevention. It's dedicated to provide non judgment or the individuals who are tier two trained are dedicated to providing non judgmental, confidential, safe space for peers with the shared goal of being approachable at any time for anyone. And so these individuals will have a special marking that we're soon to come out with. It's basically just going to be a pin that looks different than everybody else's. So to back up a little bit, you guys will all get a pin with the logo of SPO on it that also has a QR code that's embedded in it. And that QR code is something that you can scan at any time for to get different resources, anonymous reporting, um, a way that you can directly and anonymously uh, contact a tier two or one of the campus's mental health providers. We're hoping to eventually turn that into something even more developed with apps and like wellness, something that looks kind of like, um, oh, I can't remember the app right now. What's the one with the orange dot? Headspace? Yeah, so it'll look kind of like Headspace, hopefully. But anyways, the tier twos, their pins will look a little different and it's kind of a silent marking for anyone in the community to be able to approach them at any time and say, you know, I need to talk and no questions asked, we'll sit down and we'll talk with you. And then again, tier three kind of represents all of our third party resources that we have that once it gets out of the hands of tier two individuals, we'll make referrals for you to have just a little extra help that you may or may not need. Oh, that was where I said the QR code. So as you can see, this is most of the program so far, or the Pathways Project has been dedicated to developing the program itself, and so there hasn't really been much data collection on it or data that exists other than sort of just the preliminary stuff where we looked into all the other programs. But here's sort of the plan 
for how we'll analyze the program. So there'll be pre-post surveys for all of the tier one and tier two educational trainings. Um, a qualitative thematic analysis with focus groups and surveys, more for program development and quality improvement to see how well the program's working. And then use metrics just to kind of see how well. So that'll look a lot like the SOS data I showed you, just see if people are actually even using it. So ultimately the program was, whoops, hold on. <laughs> So, so far, we think we've been successful in creating a program that caters to our specific challenges. You know, our unique population of people who are already have a basic understanding of mental health and have a unique, um, or are uniquely e equipped to hide their symptoms if they need to. Um, it's designed for all members of our community, so that includes everyone from students from the medical school, the pharmacy school, all campuses, faculty, staff, from the deans to the janitors. That in itself is a bit of a challenge. And we really wanted to create a framework to try to instill this idea of culture change. Um, and we think we can start doing that through reducing the stigma and isolation. In the future, we've started to already even add ways of mac maximizing the efficacy and accessibility, so beyond even the anonymous reporting system. We've brought on um, the diversity inclusion team at MCW uh, who are specifically trained to make sure that we're catering to racial minority, minorities and the LGBTQIA plus community um, as well as just ultimately finding more ways to make this as accessible and easy for people to reach as possible. So one of my favorite quotes is that when health providers' lives are at risk, so are the, the lives of their patients. And so if you think about the impact of this program in the future, it, it has a lot larger number than you may anticipate. So ultimately the goal of my Pathways project is to improve well-being, reduce mental health crisis, and prevent future suicides for the next generation of doctors. So what to look out for coming soon is the Tier one trainings you guys will be getting in your navigation teams. The anonymous reporting launch, which will include free pins, maybe other swag for you guys. Um, and of course, we have the pilot that's going at, at Central Wisconsin that we're gonna eventually scale to institution wide. There's a lot of hands that have already gone into this project and this only acknowledges a couple of them. Um, but Dr. Cipriano, Dr. Fritz, Dr. Pranuski, these have been my go-to faculty leadership as well. I really want to acknowledge the four student leads who have put a lot of sweat and tears into this program as well. Um, Sadie Jackson, Sophie, I can't pronounce your last name, <laughs> Marissa, and Megan. And just a little circle around Sadie is she gets extra pops for designing the logo, so. <laughs> Any questions right off the bat? You can turn back now. Just kidding. <laughs> that was a total joke. Total joke. <laughs> I'm glad someone laughed. Okay. Um, <laughs> so Hayden asked if there's something I could tell myself going back to M1 year to give M1s a leg up on um, dealing with stress. Get your sleep. Feed yourself. Um, I don't know. At least for me, I was one of the ones that was like, well, if I just work harder, it'll work out. And I got myself down like super sleep deprived. And I like don't even remember that block of information. So definitely get your sleep, I think. Um, you know when enough is enough learning for the day. So listen to your body.
I got it. Yeah. Okay. Just get present there. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Hey, everybody. Um, I know it's like almost six o'clock, so if, if you have to go somewhere, I think you guys are f free to go. So, um, are you guys cool with another seven minute talk, or should we just scrap it? We're good? Okay, we'll go ahead. We can use the mouse pointer. All right, so my name is Marco, and this is Vince. Um, we kind of did this project together. Um, we were looking at the burden of unreported MTBIs, so that's mild traumatic brain injuries, in Midwestern skiers and snowboarders. Um, we basically designed this project um, to find a way that we could ski and still do research. So, yeah. um, so for the background of this project, again, we wanted to ski. Um, no, but more seriously, <laughs> because we ski and snowboard, um, we've witnessed a lot of injuries, um, primarily head injuries, on the ski hill with skiing and snowboarding, especially in the younger population that likes to do park and jumps and rails and backcountry. Um, and, and we realize that that presents a huge risk to that community and all of this, the alpine sports com community, because they don't have coaches, they don't have trainers, they don't have the spectators that are watching them as they're doing this. Nobody is going to hold them accountable and say, hey, I think you bonked your head, unless they really get hit hard. Um, and then there's ski patrol. But um, we, we kind of hypothesize that there's a lot of unreported concussions that are occurring that no one's there to witness them. Um, and, and, you know, they're pretty much um, injuries that are only known to the user or to the, to the patient unless they're really severe. So obviously there's some, some severe complications of, of mild traumatic brain injuries. So those ones that kind of lay under the covers and aren't really reported, there are some serious consequences that can happen if they remain under the covers. So one of those first ones is second impact syndrome. It's when you get a concussion when you're already concussed. It can cause pretty significant swelling and has a 50% mortality rate. So it's pretty extreme. We want to make sure people know about that. Um, and uh, we wanted to just determine whether that's occurring in our community at all. Um, and then there's increased risk of long-term stuff like CTE, as I'm sure you guys have heard, chromatic, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, Parkinsonism, and other sort of um, pathologies that will arise. And then um, there's also post-concussion syndrome, which is kind of the short-term effects of having a concussion. So, okay. Um, and one thing, real quickly, too. Um, so yeah, we're working on this project together, but it is twofold. Um, and you'll see what Marco's going to present towards the end, and his aspect is more educational based, and mine is more out on the hill collecting data, and I'll get into that. So as, the, as our title is, um, Burden of Undiagnosed Concussions on Midwestern Skiers and Snowboarders, that's our main question, but we also had two other questions. Um, we wanted to identify the certain population that's uh, most at risk for uh, concussions and suspected concussions, and then we also want to know why do undiagnosed MTBIs, head injuries, go un, um, unreported. So to do this, we developed a survey, it's 29 questions, um, and we had it on our phone, a screenshot of a QR code, and we would literally go out there and um, wouldn't ski all day, uh, but we'd be in the chalet, we'd be um, in the parking lot, we'd be on the chairlift, and we would ask people to do our survey. Um, it's about three minutes to, to take. Uh, the beginning questions are all demographics, asking your age, gender, uh, what county or even um, state that you live in. Uh, and then towards the end, we got more into questions that were asking, you know, do you wear a, um, a helmet? Do you not wear a helmet? Have you ever had a concussion? Have you ever suspected that you've had a concussion? Stuff like that. And so our results for this, now this question was a yes or no question. And it was, have you ever experienced a diagnosed concussion while skiing or snowboarding? So this is 100 and, oh, I, I actually forgot to say, um, we had 173 participants um, finish the survey. Sorry about that. So 173 people filled this out, and uh, roughly 10%, 10.5% said yes, they've had a concussion. Um, does that mean one concussion, two concussions? We'll get into that, but just yes. And then the next question was, have you ever experienced a suspected concussion while skiing or snowboarding? And again, this was a different question. All 173 participants asked this, and you can see 20.35. Um, so that's, you know, one out of every five skiers or snowboarders are going out on the hill somewhere, hitting their head hard enough that they're thinking either at that moment um, or later on, wow, I hit my head pretty hard there. That 
might have actually been a concussion, but did not go in and get it diagnosed by a healthcare provider. And to break it down even further, we asked another, uh, another question, and this was, uh, do you suspect that you've had a concussion in the last three years? But then we broke it down by age. And so you can see the age range here is from 14 to 29, and um, we went all the way up to 80. And I didn't include any of those graphs because honestly, it was pretty irrelevant compared to this. Um, most of the answers that said either one concussion, which is yellow, or two to three concussions were all this age range. Um, but out of the 173 participants, we had about half of them were above 30 and half of them were below 30. So you can see here, um, ages 14 to 17, those adolescents, again, suspected it's about one fifth. Um, and then 18 to 23, it's a little bit, oh, it's a lot less. Um, and then back up to 24 to 29, that doesn't work on there, um, is back up to 16%. And then this is the exact same question. Um, so, but instead of suspected, again, this is diagnosed and the trends from the previous graphs were the exact same um, in regards to age. The numbers are a little bit different, but um, above age 30 all the way up to 80 was um, pretty irrelevant in regards to the data that we collected. Um, okay, so we also had um, a question that was, if you, if you were to hit your head, why would you not report? And this was one of the questions that we wanted answered. Why um, would you not be willing to report a head injury? And so we had 173 results. Um, so I'll just add a few here. And a couple I want to highlight is in the upper right corner, um, it's bolded and underlined, not knowing it's a concussion. And then even the one below that, um, you're good. Uh, if it was only minor symptoms. And I um, am just highlighting those two right now because Marco's aspect of the project is about education. So, And then for the survey study conclusions, um, we say that yes, there is a burden of undiagnosed concussions because from our data, again, it was 20% of people um, from our survey suspect that they've had a head injury. And then for both diagnosed and undiagnosed, or um, uh, sorry, for both, di yeah, for both diagnosed head injuries and suspected undiagnosed head injuries, um, adolescents and young adults were most at, most at risk. And why do they go unreported? Um, well, we have 173 reasons why, uh, so there's a lot of those. All right. All right, so that kind of is the more exciting um, data-driven part of the project. Um, we're working on publishing a short, brief report on that, and it, it gets down into a lot more nuanced stuff, too. There's some really cool things. We had like 32 questions in the survey, so there's a lot of different things that we can kind of break things down by, and some that were statistically significant. So um, we'll keep you guys posted if you're interested um, when that paper comes out, hopefully, if it does. Um, but then the second part is, so we noticed this, this difference where we're seeing a lot higher rates of concussions than we expected compared to previous studies that were saying like less than 1% of skiers and snowboarders were suspected to have a concussion um, from skiing or snowboarding. We're finding it's much higher. By the way, those questions were all from skiing or snowboarding, have you had a concussion? Because we also asked concussions in general and those were also high, but those were skiing, snowboarding specific. So alpine sports specific. So we wanted to come up with kind of an alpine sports or at least an extreme sports specific um, intervention. So w the way that we kind of thought would be really good was doing a peer mentorship, as some of the other projects here have shown that peer mentorship seems to have a really high utility. Um, doing one-off talks don't, doesn't really have a statistically significant benefit um, when it comes to concussions. So we wanted to try to create a lasting impact. The way we did that was through Cranium Crew, where we find interested individuals that are maybe gonna go into healthcare, that uh, have an interest in it or are already working in healthcare. So for example, one of our peer mentors, mentors um, in Cranium Crew is this guy, Andrew. He's on ski patrol, he's an EMT. He's just an all-around stud. Um, he's a pilot too. Um, and he's gonna be a senior in high school next year, but he really uh, dove full head on into learning all he could about concussions and being an advocate and a resource for his friends. Not only when he's on ski patrol, which is great, because we want him you know, as a point man to say, you know, hey, he knows what to do and how, where to send people when they come to him, but also when he's just out there um, bumming with his friends, hitting the jumps and the rails. Um, and that's the goal, is we wanna get as many people as we can through our two-hour training to be kind of a resource for their friends and for their peers when there's not a coach, when there's not an athletic trainer, et cetera. Um, we also, even though they don't have the greatest impact, we did do some seminars um, because we feel like it's worth doing in some of these populations where they're not a traditional athlete and they're not going for like the all-athlete meeting where they talk about these things. 
Um, they may or never have really thought about concussions or talked about them if they're not a traditional athlete. So um, we were just talking to like um, ski racing, mountain bikers, skateboarders, um, some of those extreme people um, that have a high risk of concussion through their activity but are not supported by the traditional athletic framework of um, concussion protocols. So we did some seminars with those and we developed a, a pretty robust talk with some of the physician and uh, professors that we work with. Um, and then we posted that talk and some others online um, and we created a YouTube page where we'll be posting more stuff and kind of keeping up with current literature as long as um, it, you know, if it's something relevant to the community. There's so many great YouTube videos on there, so we don't need to waste too much time making our own when there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, quick plug for Andrew Huberman podcast, too. He's great if you haven't. Uh, he talks a lot about sleep and how important that is. Um, and in conclusion, um, like I said, our survey study was really, really cool that it showed this difference. It's kind of scary how many concussions we're seeing, so it, it really uh, motivated us to come up with some cool interventions. Um, that we hope will be beneficial. So we're looking for future students um, of you guys that are going to kind of carry that project further um, and continue to expand Cranium Crew, kind of look at ways to measure its impact quantitatively. We have some quanti qualitative feedback, which I took out for the sake of brevity. If you want to know more about Cranium Crew, I'm kind of blazing through it. Our poster's right over there. Um, but yeah, so that was really cool with the survey study, and we're just going to keep growing the, the uh, initiatives and uh, interventions. Um, and uh, we're working a lot with Ski Patrol, too. We're giving some talks with the new patrollers. Well, they're all patroller meeting. Um, and then just trying to build some relationships with schools. It was difficult with COVID to recruit people. We do want to recruit kids from traditional sports teams as well um, because we feel like this can still have an impact and supplement what they're doing. Um, so, but, you know, initially it was created for those extreme athletes that aren't getting caught by any other kind of concussion education net. Um, but we feel like since we've developed something that's pretty new and it seems to be effective that we could expand that to other groups. So um, the more students that are interested in helping us with this, the better. Um, we're going to be busy with clinics, so we'd love to be able to hand this off to somebody that's passionate about it and wants to carry it further. And uh, we may do more skiing survey stuff too um, if this pub publication is published. So there's opportunities for you to ski and do research at the same time too. Uh, yeah. I was going to tell you all. Any questions? Thank you, guys. No worries. All right, so we're going to wrap things up here. I'm Dr. Amy Pranuski. I just want to end by saying Dr. Norbaum and I are so proud of everything you all were able to accomplish, especially this group had to be particularly resilient with COVID and we had to make a, a number of adjustments on the projects. Um, needless to say, there's a lot more work for our incoming M1s and, and the M2s to pick up on, including skiing. So hopefully, uh, again, you guys will have made some connections with that today. Um, we can't have a physician in the community course without the community. So we just want to acknowledge all of our community mentors. Um, we can give teaching pins to recognize those, and so the three individuals that got teaching pins from last year were Eric Giordano, Patty Zemke, and Andrew Beaumont, who helped a little bit with that, the last project you heard about. Um, so another thing we do is we always, or at least since last year, we do an award for the outstanding poster and the outstanding video that was voted on prior to the event. And so this year, the outstanding poster went to Sarah Steffen. <laughs> and the outstanding video went to Hayden Schwartz. So you should definitely check out Hayden's video and, and Sarah's poster if you didn't, didn't have a chance to um, prior to the event. Uh, we, you'll also get an email. Um, the Century Funds uh, helps cover uh, some swag for you all from the MCW Bookstore for winning those awards. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention too is again looking toward next year. Um, as Colton mentioned, he had received the Community Engagement Award this is an award that we have to help support the students' projects. Um, it's been funded by 
David and Marianne Lillick, the Incredible Bank, and the Dan Story Foundation. And we have a record number of um, students, eight students that got the award for this year and just some awesome projects that are coming up. So I just want to acknowledge the students that took that extra effort to get some additional funding for their projects. And they include Alex Kirshner, Andrew Sepiel, Megan Peterson, Emlyn Zerwarski. See, I'm not doing it alphabetically, so Emlyn's not last. <laughs> Marissa O'Hare, Sadie Jackson, Ryan Gassner, and Michaela DeCoster. So just congratulations to those students. Um, so again, we're looking forward to amazing things. Um, again, this was just awesome that we were able to actually be in person and, and have some physical uh, interactions and networking. Uh, there's cookies in the lobby, and then the M3 students, if you want to take your posters, feel free. Um, otherwise, we'll keep them around and maybe use them for other things in the med school. So thank, thank you.